many other uh, This is right, uh, Arab. Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. I'm Nick Harper, and in this bulletin we'll get you all the stories developing around the world. But first, the headlines. At least eight people have died in New York in flooding-related incidents. A storm Ida affected the northeast of the United States. New York City Mayor declares a state of emergency. The US becomes the first country in the world to record 40 million COVID-19 cases as the Delta variant fuels a deadly surge. The country recorded over 180,000 fresh cases in the last 24 hours and nearly 1,500 fatalities. Any possibility of coordination against ISIS-K? It's possible. U.S. Army General Mark Milley suggests that it is possible the United States will seek to coordinate with the Taliban on counter-terrorism strikes in Afghanistan against Islamic State terrorists. To get us through not just COVID. UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab says Britain will not recognise the Taliban in the near future, but admits that there is a need to engage directly with the group. Britain says the Taliban would be judged by their actions, not their words. Russia's foreign minister says that Moscow has no plans of mediating the intra-Afghan talks and that all eyes are now on a possible agreement between the Taliban and other ethnic forces, especially the resistance force. Flash floods from tropical storm Ida have swamped New York City. The remnants of the storm cause massive flooding in America's financial and cultural capital. And it's also left the boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens inundated by the deluge. At least eight people have lost their lives in flash floods in New York City. Eyewitness videos from the city of New York showed rainwater from tropical storm Ida gushing into subway stations. These visuals are from the Jefferson Street station. Many of New York's subway stations were submerged in water. Flash flooding turned platforms and stairwells into waterfalls, bringing a century-old system grinding to a halt. Nearly all of New York City's subway lines were suspended. Some roads in New York City were completely submerged. Videos posted on social media showed multiple motorists stranded in their vehicles in Yonkers. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio declared a state of emergency due to what he called a historic weather event, and he urged residents to move to higher ground. Just outside of New York City, in Rye, people were seen walking through water up to their thighs on Wednesday night. The National Weather Service recorded more than three inches of rain in New York's Central Park in an hour. That's far surpassing the 1.9 inches that fell in one hour during Tropical Storm Henri on August the 21st, which was at the time believed to be the most ever recorded in the park. In Staten Island and in Queens, vehicles were completely inundated and they were seen floating in floodwaters.
On top of that, hundreds of flights had to be cancelled at nearby Newark, LaGuardia and JFK airports. And flooding has closed major roads across Manhattan and the boroughs of Queens and the Bronx. Streets in Brooklyn were also submerged and residents were seen wading in thigh-high water. Meanwhile, in the neighbouring state of New Jersey, the governor there, Phil Murphy, also declared a state of emergency in response to Ida, which has been downgraded to a tropical storm. At least five flash flood emergencies were issued on Wednesday, stretching from just west of Philadelphia through northern, northern New Jersey. Hurricane Ida slammed into the southern state of Louisiana on Sunday, bringing severe flooding and tornadoes as it blazed a trail of destruction through the north. It caused heavy damage in the states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Maryland. The tornado ripped up streets and toppled electricity poles. More than 70,000 homes and businesses were left without power. Hurricanes are common in the southern United States, but scientists have warned of a rise in cyclone activity, saying that climate change poses an increasing threat to the world's coastal communities. Well, for the latest on this, we can cross to our Weon correspondent, Susan Tirani, who's joining us live from New York. Well, Susan, look, we've seen incredible footage of this flood. What's the situation like currently where you are? Absolutely incredible, Nick. What a difference a few hours makes. Uh, the sun is shining. People are out and about right now. And while there was a state of emergency declared until around 5 a.m. this morning, subway systems are running and um, that state of emergency has been lifted. But it was a shock really to New York City. We really didn't expect something like this uh, to happen, notably uh, the flood. And for the first time in New York history, we saw flash flood emergencies really coming through last night. Not one, but five. Uh, as you mentioned, unfortunately, uh, we did see deaths. We saw eight deaths, and most of those deaths uh, were uh, in basements because the level of water just came high. It was difficult to evacuate ages ranging from two years old to 50 years old. But right now, I'm just going to stand back, as you can see behind me. Uh, the sun is shining. Uh, water has subsided. Even uh, the images uh, that you've seen on social media, perhaps, and that, that are coming out from uh, news wires of the biggest uh, freeway, uh, the FDR Drive, and also uh, on the West Side Highway as well, which was submerged in water. Those levels have went down. And and people are driving on the freeway both sides of the Manhattan Island uh, out and about. Well, Susan, the weather certainly having improved there, but I guess it's going to be an incredible cleanup operation from here on out. Does it feel like emergency services have the situation under control? concern right now and uh, you know uh, officials here right now are really relying uh, not only on local uh, cleanup operations but they're saying because this was so unexpected that they're hoping uh, that they'll reach out to Washington and they'll also get uh, some help from FEMA and the federal government as well cleanup operations really are ongoing and you know I did mention this uh, and the situation in Manhattan this situation right now while it's been a lot better uh, this morning. Uh, it's not completely dry outside of Manhattan, for example, in Queens and outwards of uh, the city, uh, for example, the Bronx and other boroughs as well. So uh, we're going to rely on the officials uh, here locally, but definitely it's going to branch out. Uh, we had a congresswoman, Nicole Mayakatas, really saying that uh, the federal government has to step in just because it was so unexpected. Uh, we really didn't expect something like this to happen so fast. Susan, thank you very much. That was Susan Tarani reporting live from New York. Thank you, Susan. That was Susan Tarani reporting live from New York.
Lake Tahoe is the largest alpine lake in North America, and all through the year it attracts thousands of tourists from Nevada and California who descend on the resort city for the landscape with casinos there. But for the last 18 days, this resort city has been in the grip of a deadly wildfire, resulting in evacuations of stranded tourists. Our next report has the details. The Caldor fire broke out on the 14th of August. Helped by the bone dry forests and upslope canyon winds, the fire has burned through over 200,000 acres of land and, as of this week, has been just 20% contained. Firefighters have been battling the blaze and have tried to keep it away from urban communities. The city of South Lake Tahoe, at this time of the year, would generally be buzzing with thousands of tourists. But with the fire just miles away from the resort city, South Lake Tahoe bears a deserted look. Pretty much everybody else in the building had already gone. I'm the manager and uh, I was making sure things were done and then the sheriff came along and knocked on the door and said, it's mandatory, you have to leave right now. So it took me a few minutes to throw, throw a few more things together and close up the house and I left. An estimated 22,000 residents and tourists have fled from South Lake Tahoe so far. The evacuees have been offered temporary shelter in the adjoining towns of Reno and Carson City. We were evacuated and we came on the bus uh, from Lake Tahoe down here to Carson City. And they've been quite kind and they've given us what we've needed. So it hasn't been as bad as it could have been. We were evacuated due to the fire. Thick smoke has engulfed the Lake City. All casinos and tourist haunts have been shut, while hotels are being used to house firefighters and other displaced residents. The Caldor fire so far has gutted 700 structures, but is threatening over 33,000 homes in the next 10 days. To contain the blaze, California has pressed into service over 2,000 firefighting personnel with about 23 planes equipped with water buckets and fire retardants. The next week will be crucial. Extreme heat and dry weather due to climate change is believed to be the reason for these incessant fires. Bureau Report, Beyond World is One. A New York Times report has detailed how America's Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, used one of its black sites in Afghanistan to conduct clandestine evacuations. It happened before the U.S. destroyed parts of the base and left the country for good in the weeks leading up to America's August 31st withdrawal deadline. The exhaustive report by the New York Times visual analysis team details precisely how the intelligence agency wound up its operations there before the Taliban finally went on to reclaim it soon after the last of the U.S. troops had left the war-torn country. Satellite imagery captured by Planet Labs showed the vast compound five kilometers away from Kabul's Hamid Karzai airport to the northeast, covering an area of about 5.1 square kilometers. The fully enclosed compound, dotted with guard towers, had two gates on either side. It also consisted of a heliport to the east and several buildings, including warehouses and hangars to park aircraft and at its western gate, an area called the Salt Pit. The NYT report says that the CIA started destroying buildings within this area through the months of April and May, soon after the US president had announced the withdrawal date. The report also says that the CIA used this site to conduct, and I quote, enhanced interrogation techniques. At the north of the base were two complexes jointly designated as New Eagle Base, housing structures such as ammunition depots and training sites. It was reportedly one of the many facilities in Afghanistan during the US occupation where the CIA trained Afghan forces. According to the report, the CIA demolished these facilities to prevent the Taliban getting their hands on sensitive information and materials such as documents, hard drives and equipment. 
during August. While the US rushed to wind up its diplomatic operation in Afghanistan, the CIA used the base to conduct clandestine evacuations of VIP personnel and some at-risk Afghans. The report also confirmed how the CIA used MI-17 helicopters for flights between the compound and Hamid Karzai airport in Kabul, and they did that so as not to attract attention, since the Russian-made helicopters were commonly flown by the Afghan military. In a bid to stop gun violence, San Francisco is rolling out a pilot program that will pay high-risk individuals to not shoot anyone. The idea is to provide small numbers of citizens who authorities believe are most at risk of shooting someone or themselves being shot with an incentive to get help and stay out of trouble. The program, which will launch as a pilot in October, is called the Dreamkeeper Fellowship and has been described as giving money to not shoot people. The initiative is part of Mayor London Breed's $60 million investment in San Francisco's black and African-American community and a way to combat gun crimes that are ticking up in the city. The Dream Keeper Fellowship will pay $300 to 10 individuals who are at high risk of being on either end of a shooting. Not only this, but the participants of the programme will also be paired with life coaches from the city's street violence intervention programme and will further serve as community ambassadors to prevent rising gun violence in the city. Shootings in San Francisco have spiked, with 119 recorded gun crimes in the first half of this year. The new programme is being launched as California becomes the first state to pay drug addicts a few hundred dollars to stay sober. Meanwhile, critics of the program have pointed out that similar initiatives have not been successful in the past, with many stressing that criminals need jail rather than cash.